Wedge Issues is brought to you by Wispolitics.com, a place where political insiders go for news, opinion, and campaign information. Once again, that's Wispolitics.com. So when I was 19, to the best of my recollection, I was trying to not sleep through my early morning classes and I was spending a lot of time worrying about what I was going to do with the rest of my life. Kaylin Haywood, on the other hand, at the age of 19, was just sworn in to start representing Wisconsin's 16th Assembly District in the state capitol. I'm Jesse O'Poyan and this is Wedge Issues, a Cap Times podcast about state government and politics in Wisconsin. I sat down with Representative Haywood recently to talk about what it's like being, to his knowledge and everyone else's, the youngest state legislator in the country. We talked about why he wanted to run for office, how he got his start in politics, and what he's hoping to accomplish during his time at the Capitol. Stay tuned for my conversation with Representative Haywood, but first let's check in on what's happening in the Capitol this week. Eric, how's it going? It's good. Are it's like a warm? little bit, yeah, it's a little bit brisk outside, I've found. A little bit. A little bit, yeah. yeah. It's, it's been chilly this week. Yeah, I've, I've, I've been feeling that. I've been feeling that. Yeah, I uh, took a comp day yesterday, stayed at home, cozied up in my apartment, and I took one walk around the block just to see what it was like, and mm-hmm. it hurt my face <laughs> this so was, much. This was Wednesday. This was like this was the Wednesday. worst this of the days. This was Wednesday. This yeah. is the negative... 30-ish day with wind chills and the God only knows what. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's pretty cold out there. It is. I was going to work from home on Wednesday and I got a little stir crazy. So I ended up going to the Capitol, but it was kind of a ghost town in downtown Madison. Um, I bet that was a little bit beautiful, though, because it was a sunny day. It was nice you know? outside. It was actually, yeah. like, yeah. outside. I mean, it wasn't nice outside, but it was, like, tr- it was pretty to look at. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. was awful outside, I but mean, it looked nice. Nice is relative. You sure. Know? Yeah. You know, we're all here on this planet. That's a nice <laughs> thing. <laughs> I'm grateful for that every day. I'm just trying to look yeah. on the bright side as extreme as I may have to reach for it. Yeah, yeah. even the bars closed down, many of them, restaurants. It's Things have been serious. Well, okay. all weather aside, let's talk about some of the news of the week here. And there was a pretty big news story that came out that uh, got some national attention, which is that Foxconn, according to certain reports, uh, seems to no longer be interested in creating a manufacturing facility at their new technology campus that they're building in southeastern Wisconsin. Instead, they are sort of pivoting and now they're talking about an R&D facility of some kind. Yeah, a report came out from Reuters. They interviewed Louis Wu, who's one of the top executives at Foxconn, and he said the focus of the facility that they're building in Wisconsin is likely going to shift away from manufacturing and be a lot more oriented toward research and design and development and, and basically said, we're not building a factory. We're not probably going to be able to make the LCD panels for TVs that we've talked about because it just like the market doesn't make sense for us. And so that news came out and a lot of Democrats who had opposed the deal said, hey, we told you so. And some Republicans said, this isn't Foxconn's fault. This is Tony Evers fault because Mm -hmm. he's, you know, giving them uncertainty. And other Republicans who have supported the deal said, well, is it really such a bad thing that it's going to be more R&D and design focused? Maybe that's okay. Mm. So a lot of different perspectives coming out of this this week, but it sounds like conversations between the Evers administration and Foxconn are continuing and they're going to try to figure out how to move forward from here. Yeah. I mean, does this mean anything in terms of the tax incentives deal? Does anything mean anything, Eric? <laughs> oh, this is a very existential I'm really conversation. Bleak this week. Um, yeah, it, I mean, it could. It could. So that's the, the way that this deal is structured. Um, Foxconn has to meet certain job creation and retention uh, thresholds. They have to meet some capital investment thresholds. So if they don't create the jobs, they don't get the tax credits that are tied to creating those jobs. Um, there are some tax credits that are just tied to capital investment. So, you know, there there are some things that it would affect and there are some things that it might not affect it. I think we don't know enough at this point about the timeline and how things are going to go. There are actually 
new reports. This is we're recording this on Thursday, and even at this time, the story is still kind of evolving. We don't know what the, if, if their timeline might be changing. There's some reports now that their um, timeline for even just production at the facility might be uh, slowed down now. So we're doing a lot of wait and see, um, and I, I think we'll probably learn a little bit more about this in, in the next few weeks when the Ebers administration has more of a chance to talk to the company about it. Yeah. Do you know, has President Trump said anything about this? I mean, this was kind of a, a deal that he really touted as a win for you know manufacturing in the United he States. He did, and he even called it the eighth wonder of the world when he came to visit Mount Pleasant for the groundbreaking. Watch uh, out, hanging gardens. <laughs> of Babylon are coming for you. Um, I don't, I, he, yeah, to my knowledge, he has not weighed in yet. It's definitely, though, like every time I've flipped on, you know, cable news or, or surfed through, surfed the web and checked out the, <laughs> the national websites, it's, it's been a little bit of a national story in the last 24 to 48 hours for sure. Definitely. Okay, moving on, we have a new Marquette University Law School poll to look at. And this is the first one that has come out since Governor Tony Evers took office. So I, I guess what are the what are the big takeaways in your mind here, Jesse? Yeah, I think this was uh, probably more good news for Governor Evers than bad. Um, you know, if you're looking at individual approval numbers, it's still pretty early and a lot of people don't know who he is or who other people in power, regardless of party, are. Um, so there's not a lot to be gleaned from that at this point. But there are some issues that are really important to Governor Evers, in particular health care. 62 percent of voters said that they think Wisconsin should accept federal money to expand Medicaid. That's something that Tony Evers has said that's going to be part of his budget. And it's also something that Republicans in the legislature have said is a non-starter. So that's something that, you know, he's he said he's going to try to rely on public pressure for this, try to get support and, and get that to convince legislators to be OK with it. Um, and it does sound like there is some public support for it at this point. Uh, school funding is another thing that's really important to not just Tony Evers, but everyone. But he's made this a priority in a much more significant way. He wants to put $1.4 billion in new funding for K-12 education in his budget. That's a lot of money. And I think some Republicans are asking, where are we going to get that? But what we're seeing, and this has been a trend for a few months, is that still more voters prioritize more school funding over lower property taxes. So there might be some willingness to pay a little bit more in taxes to see more money go to schools. Um, There also is a lot of support, like more than 70 percent of voters support uh, a major increase in special education funding. Tony Evers is proposing a $600 million increase in special education funding. So there, those things are, are lining up for him. Uh, another thing that's been a priority for Democrats is redistricting uh, changes to mm. move that to a, a nonpartisan commission, sort of like Iowa does, instead of having maps for the elections be drawn by the legislature and approved by the governor. Uh, 72% of voters said they want uh, that to be handled by a nonpartisan commission, which again, is that's pretty, a lot. It's a that's lot. A lot. Yeah. It's a lot. Uh, and, and marijuana. 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 What are uh, our thoughts well, <laughs> these days? Personally, uh, <laughs> no, uh, 59% of voters support legalizing marijuana. Not even, there, there wasn't a question about you know medical versus recreational. It was just yeah. straight up 59% are in favor of legalizing and, it. And I think you mentioned in your news story going over some of these findings, this was like the first time, right, that there was a majority of people. It is, yeah. yeah. It's, um, I don't have the, the year in front of me the last time Marquette asked about that, but it was a while ago in, in the last time that they did, it was uh, 46% of voters who supported it. So we have seen that actually shift in the last few years. That's another interesting area where, you know, there could be some potential for compromise, but it already looks like it's going to be a tricky uh, process. You know, some Republicans, particularly in the Assembly, have said they would favor medical marijuana, but with a lot of limitations, they don't want that to be a step toward uh, full legalization or for recreational use. Tony Evers has talked about introducing you know, steps toward medical marijuana and potentially steps toward uh, full legalization. And, and, and that's something that most Republicans are, are not in favor of at this point, it sounds like. Gotcha. Um, so s- super quickly, we also wanted to acknowledge that Governor Tony Evers has announced a task force, a, a transportation 
Stakeholders, uh, it? It's transportation, transportation stakeholders, stakeholders, task force, force. all together now. <laughs> We've had a hard time remembering that name. <laughs> so there are a lot of people on this task force, more than 30 members. I don't even know which ones to pick out to name, but the point is there, um, there are legislators from both sides of the aisle on this task force. There are representatives of local government. There are representatives of you know, economic development type groups, of, of labor groups, of railroads, trucking, all kinds of different uh, stakeholders, as the name would suggest, who are going to be meeting the next few weeks to start talking about what a transportation budget ought to look like as Governor Evers works on forming his transportation budget, which his budget will come to us uh, in about a month, actually, at the end of February. It sounds like we will be getting that. Yeah, that will be quite a uh Quite a uh, quite a process in a split government. So it's gonna it's, be yeah. fun. Yeah. Well, thank you as always for having me. Thank talking you for about coming the news in. Of the week. Please stay warm. Although this weekend it's gonna be really warm. Yeah, and like rainy. Yeah. It's gonna be. It's gonna be weird. Weather's weird, man. Weird. So so weird. And well, Wisconsin also a little weird. Yeah. It's all just weird. Yeah. Yeah. Well, on that note, bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> State Representative Kaylin Haywood. I represent the six, I'll call it the sensational 16th district of Milwaukee, or Wisconsin. It represents uh, most of downtown Milwaukee, parts of the north and east side. Well, the district is very unique. I, I think it, I think I think it's the best one in the state. I know I'm a little biased. <laughs> a little biased. <laughs> <laughs> but it's unique to me because it represents some of the wealthiest people in Milwaukee, but also some of the poorest. I have the finance reform downtown in my district, but I also have uh 5206 um, with it with many challenges. So it's, it's, it's a job. I, I think it's like, it keeps me busy for sure. Yeah. Um, and you're, do we know, are you the youngest le- so, legislator in the country? And I'm the youngest in the state for a mm-hmm. fact. Um, I just always use the word likely because no one's ever been able to confirm if I'm the youngest in the country. Okay. But, you know, I, I believe I am the youngest African-American ever in the state of Wisconsin. Wow. I, can, I, think I can say that with That's confidence. I can say that with confidence. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so. As we know now, I'm most likely the youngest in the country. There have been some very popular news sources that have said I'm the youngest, so I just quote them when I usually say I'm the youngest. <laughs> and I was like, well, now this says it, I usually go with it. Yeah. Um, I think it's thoroughly vetted out through them, but you never know. You're 19. Yeah. Okay. And are you in college right now? I am currently at Cardinal Church University studying business administration with a emphasis on finance. Great. Well, um, what made you want to run for office? It's, I've, I've read that you've wanted to do this for quite a while. So this break that uh, you can see is still, but the break is actually, the, it's the day we had, like, my family does development. So we had a groundbreaking in front of our um, properties in the mayor came. I believe the date was August, no, October, October 17th, 20, 2007. I always do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, that the mayor came, I'm like, who's this guy getting out of his SUV with these bodyguards and with these long black trench coats? So I'm like, who's this guy? I'm going to find out who he is. Um, so I introduced to him, like, he's the mayor, and he got, he got up on the microphone and started speaking. And I'm like, whatever he does, that's the coolest job in the world I want it. I'm like, Even though my dad's job is pretty cool, I want that job. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I asked my parents about it, what, what he actually did, and they told me he was the mayor and what the government's about. So me being a, a young person. I asked more questions. I had a computer at the time, so I went on the internet and started looking up government and whatnot. When I was 13, um, I found out about the Youth Council. Um, the city of Milwaukee has a Youth Council, which is the most powerful Youth Council in the country. Not because I'm being biased, but it's the truth. Um, we're the only Youth Council in the country that gets to allocate actual dollars. So we get 10% of the city's reprogramming dollars to allocate every every cycle. Um, so I found out about the Youth Council. And uh, I read the, read the brochure and it said you had to be 14 to join. I knew I wasn't 14. I'm like, I'm still going to try and see what happens. So I applied and the, the city clerk told me I was too young and that he would keep it on file and I should reach out again once I'm of age. Uh, I'm like, okay, sure. Are you sure I'm too young? He's like, yes. <laughs> so when I, when I turned 14, my the seat was currently filled by another youth council member. So what, But she was transitioning out. It was her senior year in high school. So that um, following summer of my freshman year, I went to a garden on Knife and Ring. It's a community garden in the city and where young boys work every Saturday during the summer to help clean the neighborhood up and work in the garden and learn about um, how to plan and all, all the good stuff. Um, but Alder Woman College is there. Um, she's the Alder Woman for the 6th um, District in Milwaukee, and she's also the chair of finance. 
um, the finance committee for the city. Um, she's like, oh, the seat's spraying up. I know you told me you wanted to join. You should probably reapply now. And I said, really? So I instantly went to, I went home that night and reapplied and got an email from the clerk probably that Monday or Tuesday. I was in that week, same week for a tour and an interview. And that Friday, it was official. Yeah, I kind of forgot what the question was at this point. Oh, why did I, how, how, did, how did I want to um, get this? That's, that's why I always, but then being on the youth council really made me know I wanted to run for office. Mm-hmm. Um, I had the leverage and power to do things on the youth council that were I'm grateful for. But there's all things I also things I couldn't do because it was just, it was an appointed position. So my once I am in the elected position, I can do the things I couldn't do then. So it just gave me that much more power to actually fight and be an advocate for people and get stuff done and get the work done. So the ability to make an impact and seeing the smiles people faces. So we do the grant grant um, process. When the nonprofit would come to me and say, oh, they did X, Y, and Z with the dollars, and I see the impact it had and the smiles on people's faces, like that made me happy. So I want to continue like making an impact and making people happy. So are there um, policy areas that you're like, really passionate about that you're hoping to work on? Um, can you tell me about the committees that you're on and just sort of the things that you think you're going to try to do in your first term here? Um, so I focus my entire campaign and my office on three things. One, education. Education is fundamental to a young person's growth. Um, is isn't the answer to all of our issues, but it is fundamental. And then also economic development. Rather, it is housing. In my district, we have some of the nicest houses in the city, but also um, some neighborhoods where there's vacant houses on every block, boarded up houses, empty lots. So economic development comes to housing, make sure people have quality, affordable housing. And then also employment. Make sure there are, there are actually good paying jobs nearby. And then for the ones that aren't nearby, how we get people to those jobs with transportation. So... Education, economic development, and then also public safety. We have to, one, make sure people feel safe in our neighborhoods. It makes me sad when I have residents who've been in their homes for 30, 40 years, who own their homes. Homeowners who say they don't come outside now because they're sure to come outside. We have that issue. And then also a public safety, we have to work on, the, I want to work on the reentry process for um, inmates. When they come back to society, what, so my, my dad made an interesting thing to me. So my dad has a car and it's leased. And I said, hey, dad, when your lease is done, can I buy your car? And he was like, if you were my age when I was my, when I was 19, I would say yes. But the way things are moving now, I would say no because two years from now, this car's going to be outdated and going to be old and no one's going to want it because of how technology's moving, mm-hmm. which, is, which is important because it's true. So you sent someone to prison for 10 years. I'm only 19. But just half of my life ago, things were so much different than they are today. The iPhone that I had was nowhere near being designed. It was like a, a thing in a movie that people made up. Yeah. So... We have to find ways to make sure that we, when they, we are re-entering into society, we get them, with, we connect them with jobs before they leave prison. Like, let's get you, let's get you trained, even with the skills where you can get out, you can actually find a job, or if we have employers hire you before you get out. Um, but also make sure they're equipped with the technology resources. And they know what's going on. It's like I can't stress how much of a disadvantage they're at when we send them out into a world they don't know. So some people are ten years, some people have been in prison for thirty years. It's something to so. Education, economic development, and then public safety are my three things. Uh, I'm on for committees I'm on Ways and Means, which deals with um, taxes. Um, I was told Ways and Means stands for Ways and Means to make the state money. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, okay, this is interesting. So uh, working with the ta- tax tax code and taxes and TIF and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, workforce development, which plays right into the economic development piece. Um, make sure that we get people connect them with the good paying jobs. I want to make sure we connect people with jobs at the capital. All right, we have the people. We, I want people here. I want people from Milwaukee to be able to, like, this is the outlet for you to go. Um, so workforce development and then also housing and real estate. <laughs> mm-hmm. Work on housing around the state. Make sure we have affordable housing. And then international affairs and commerce. That committee is about making sure that Wisconsin is a key player on the international stage. And then um, veteran and military affairs, which is somehow, it's not really economic development. It's not really public safety. It's not really um, education. But I have a family full of veterans, uh, and it's very important that we make sure that we give them the best um, opportunities that we can. You know, it makes me sad when I um, see homeless people on the streets, and they're they're, they're veterans. They they serve this country. They want to get sacrifice their lives to serve and protect us, and then now they come back, and no one's here helping them. So I want to make sure that we do what we can to help them out. Have you thought about um, legislation you might introduce? Um, I'm actually right now. This has actually been a pretty busy week for me. I've been trying to build my legislative agenda. Um, and make it, so I want to do things from focus on partnerships one because legislation moves government moves really slow so I have legislation of, of things I want to get done there's a, currently a bill, a bill that requires 
all high school students to take a civics exam before they can graduate. Mm -hmm. My thing is, why can't we, in that same instance, get them registered to vote, or at least give them the opportunity to register to vote? It takes five extra minutes. So that's something I'm looking at for sure. Um, There's some things around employment I'm looking at. Nothing nothing I can announce officially, but it will be, the legislation I will focus on will be surrounded around education, economic development, and then public safety. So that's that's what I'm going to do through legislation, but also all things I feel that can be done without even me going through the legislature and actually working on partnerships with other local leaders. Has anything about, I know it's only been a couple of weeks, but has anything surprised you about uh, the Capitol since you've gotten here? Um, I'm here a lot more than I thought I was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I was told that we don't, we come here probably half the month and we're in the district the other half. But I, the last two weeks I've been here um, probably 80% of the time, which is good. I mean, we're getting the, the foundation down and, uh, but this is a beautiful building. I mean, I think it's one that I'm, I'm a big like architect nerd, so <laughs> I like to walk around and look at the look at the character of the building. And every room is different. Every wing is different. Um, I actually went on a tour to explain how the Capitol was rebuilt and how they started with the East Wing. And you can notice how each it, it gets better. It, it starts off good, then slowly gets a little different as you yeah. move around. <laughs> but um, it's a beautiful building, and uh, yes. but just the whole dynamic. This is a different dynamic than it is at the city. It's definitely a lot more intense and there's a lot going on and um if you take a day off you usually out the loop so you, there's, a, there's really no days off yeah that's true but you yeah. want i want us to make sure i stay one i stay in, in the capital getting the work done but also i have to stay visible in the district my biggest concern and problem one of, one of my biggest problems with people when i was in the district they would communicate to me that electors only come around during campaign season mm-hmm. which is true they only come around no campaign season so my my vow to myself was break that tradition like come around more than just campaign season so i work with my staff to make sure i'm in the district enough um make sure we block out certain days in my calendar where i'm actually going to be in the district i don't care if i'm just walking around to restaurants i want to be in the district visible talking to residents knocking on doors um we have to make people feel like they are a part of government and that government is coming around so i can get your vote in two years Wedge Issues is sponsored by WISPolitics.com. You can become a WISPolitics.com member. Find out more at WISPolitics.com slash membership. Has it been fun or or weird or upsetting to have so much focus on you being as young as you are? Is it it kind of, I guess, is it it a a benefit or, or a distraction? I think it's actually good. I think I mean I believe that one me being young and me getting all this press and this media and all this interest uh, is a couple of things. One is bringing young people to the forefront, letting people young, letting young people know young people can do it, and also letting the older generation know that young people can do it. That's that's a big thing. Um, but also, it's opening the doors for young people to get involved in politics. Running for office isn't for everyone. It's not everyone's thing. Um, most people, some people won't like it. But I do want people to get involved with the political process, whether it's just being an educated voter, whether it is voting, whether it's working at polls, campaigning, working in the office. I want to open up that door for young people to know that they can be involved in politics now. Um, a lot of people will tell you that, or you probably know this, that the votes that we take now usually don't affect the people who are taking the votes. It usually, affect, it usually affects my generation two, five, 10, 20 years from now. So... I want young people my age to get involved and be aggressive when it comes to the political process, but also just not even politics. It lets them know that whatever you want to do, you can do it. The average age, I was told the average age for a state rep or state senator in the country is a 55-year-old white man. Um, I'm 19, I'm kind of black. <laughs> so it changes that narrative and lets that young black man like, that, look, that can see themselves in me like, you can do it, you can do it now. You don't have to wait. My issue with us being told, I was always told, like, wait your turn. It's going to come around. Mm-hmm. The issue is when we wait our turn, we wait till we're 25, maybe even 30. In that time gap, stuff happens. Mistakes are made. So now when we get to the age that we, that it's our turn now, we can't do it because of stuff that happened in the past. I, young people, I feel, bring the energy to the table, but our elders and older adults and more more experienced adults bring in that wisdom. But in order to get things done, we have to combine the energy with the wisdom to get it done. So I think uh, this the press around has been great. Um, I, I like it. I mean, 
I feel like a kind of a celebrity now. <laughs> you know, I, I get stopped everywhere, but it's good because it gives me people, it gives me the ear of the person that's inquiring about me being 19 and wants to meet me. But also I hope to see that my age, me being young, people wanting to meet me and see where my head is. It allows me to bridge the gap uh, with the parties because we're in divided government right now. We have a Democratic governor, Republican controlled legislature. So uh, I want to be an ally to everyone and bridge the gap so we can actually do some work done for the people. Have you um, had any like role models or, or mentors along the way that kind of are trying to model yourself after or um, helped you get into politics? If, if there's been so many mentors that would be unfair to name yeah. just, just yeah. one uh, or a few. But I would, I would say it's about mentors. I was taught to always treat everyone with the same respect. I feel like you can learn something from anybody, regardless of age, gender, demographic, um, job status, whatever it may be. I feel like you can learn something from the janitor, but also learn something from the president of the United States, whoever he or she may be. But at the same time, I can learn from a five-year-old something I can learn from a 50-year-old. You never know. Mm-hmm. I feel that it brings... So everyone I meet, I take it very seriously. I treat them all with the same respect, and I listen. I try to listen more than I talk. I'm a politician. I do. I can talk if you ask me to. <laughs> Um, but I try to listen to people and honestly learn something from everyone. It's the perspective is important. I may learn something. I, I might not make it useful. I might not use it. But the fact that I was able to learn that and grasp that, it just makes my, my arsenal for what I know a lot bigger. So I try to listen to everyone. All right. I'm going to ask you a couple non-politics questions now. I like those questions better. Good. <laughs> uh, what do you listen to on your commute back and forth? So it's time about an hour drive, maybe an hour and 20 minutes. Some mornings, it's, it's talk radio. Mm-hmm. I, I, if, I'm, if I'm riding by myself, it's talk radio. I don't want to be alone. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, sometimes when I'm, I'm, it's going to be a long day. I know it is. Um, I usually, I mean, Drake is like, Drake is my guy. So, <laughs> so like, I play some Drake and, like, Drake has multiple albums that it, he changes. Like, multiple, his albums we have different moods. So, mm-hmm. uh, let's just some Drake and try to get in, like, get in my zone and, uh, Get excited for the day to get some work done. So either talk radio or I'm listening to some Drake. That's an interesting combination. <laughs> <laughs> um, if someone were visiting your district, what are like three or just a handful of things that you would recommend that they check out, like a restaurant or a park or whatever? Um, one, I would, I would, I would inquire. They reach out to me and then they come talk to me. <laughs> yeah. That's the first thing. But if you're looking to have some fun, um, the Pfizer reform, of course, and make sure you visit the Bucks. I, I believe as of now, the Bucks are the best team in the Eastern Conference. So make sure you visit the Bucks. Um, depending on how old you are, Water Street is a, has an extremely well, extremely good nightlife in the district. Um, but yeah, you know, if you want to come to, on a tour of the district with me, I would say uh, we could go downtown and visit some of the nicer businesses and the restaurants. Um, Moe's Steakhouse is a, a more upscale restaurant, but it's very nice. And we also have local spots like um, Mi Casa Sioux Cafe, Rise and Grind, um, King Drive is from about one up until maybe Center Street is a very dynamic street with biz- local businesses. Uh, make sure I would say visit that. Um, but yeah, come visit with me. I'll show you the best and the worst of the district. I'll show you the fun spots. Um, so when I try to travel, um, usually when I go on conferences or trips, they keep me in the downtown area where everything's mm-hmm. nice and vibrant. I'm like, no, take me in the area, the parts that need to work. I want to mm-hmm. see that. I want to see that too. Um, so I would encourage people to not only visit downtown. Yeah. So visit the, visit the north end of my district, but also visit the south end. Okay. You probably don't have a lot of time to relax because you're in school, but what do you do if you have free time? I try to sleep. <laughs> yeah, I don't a lot of that. Um, but honestly, though, um, maybe like I, I do. I'm not. I'm not a big partier. That's not my mm-hmm. thing. Uh, I'm more of a relaxed environment type of guy. So if I'm not sleep or I'm not at home watching Netflix, I, just, I like. I like. I, if I find a Netflix series, I will mm-hmm. binge watch like all day long on a weekend. But um, I tend to go. I like to go bowling. I think I'm pretty good at it. Uh, <laughs> some of my friends um, have this friend group we call ourselves um, the top five. So like we just five of us, and uh, we have this little competition going. I'm usually it usually happens. I'm always the, I'm always in first place until maybe the ninth or tenth go around, okay. and then someone comes and beats me. I end up in second. <laughs> but um, I, I'm really really relaxed person. So get going to go out to eat, relax, and uh, I try to use my spare time just to mellow out and. It helps me think a lot more. I can just relax. Yeah. What's the best thing that you've binged on Netflix lately? <sighs> That's a good question. Um, what did I just finish? I just finished watching Greenleaf. Oh, yeah. Okay. 
Um, Greenleaf is a very interesting show to watch. There's a lot going on. Greenleaf, um, Ozark, House of Cards is actually one of my favorite Netflix series. Okay. Um, not a big fan of it now, mm-hmm. but before it was like now I had to watch it. Um, Madam Secretary. Mm-hmm. I like shows that are I actually like find shows around that are showing around government very interesting. Uh-huh. Um, there was actually one I can't think of it. It was, it was one where Des- Designated Survivor. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm looking for another season of that. Yeah. So if Netflix hears this, please make sure you have another season. Um, but yeah, that was, that, was, that was a really good show. Okay. Yeah. I noticed there is a lion statue on your desk here. What's, tell me about that. So um, my father's a very big role model in my life. Um, and at his office, he always had lions in his office. And it just he uses it as a symbol of bravery and not having fear and just, being, just conquering everything you do. So I like when I get an office, I make sure I, I put lines. This is the first time. This is actually a Christmas gift from my mother. Um, she knows she knows getting an office. She mm-hmm. wanted to give me a gift. Um, yeah, it's just it's just a symbol of like reminding myself that you have to be brave and go out there and conquer whatever you want to conquer. That's a good symbol. Okay, last question. I ask everyone I interview this: What's your favorite Wisconsin cheese? I'm not a big ch- oh, so I'm lactose intolerant. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, but cheese is a guilty pleasure. Okay. Um, I like cheddar cheese really a lot. I really like cheddar cheese. Yeah. I shouldn't eat it, but I well, do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, moderation, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Oh, music soft and sweet, just like the girls I like to meet. And since my heart still likes to be, I'm Thank you for listening to Wedge Issues. Our theme music is Oh, Wisconsin by Loxley. We'll be back every Friday with new episodes, so make sure you're subscribed on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts to stay up to date. If you like what you hear, you can leave us a rating or a review on iTunes. That helps us out a little bit. If you have feedback or suggestions for me, you can find me on Twitter at Jesse Opie, J-E-S-S-I-E-O-P-I-E, or you can email me at J-O-P-O-I-E-N at Madison.com. You can also check out our other Cap Times podcasts like The Corner Table and The Mad Splainers. Check back next week for an interview with Senator Fred Risser, the longest serving state legislator in the country. See you then. Wedge Issues has been brought to you by Wispolitics.com. There are plenty of benefits to becoming a member. You can go to Wispolitics.com membership to find out more.